Experience Association and Consumer Electronics Association discussion panel, where we're going to be focusing on new approaches to the use of consumer electronics on airplanes. Now, whilst I imagine that all of you uh, are, are very fondly and you know, you know CEA very much, I'm not sure everyone in the room knows what APEX is. So APEX, the Airline Passenger Experience Association, is an association of airlines, businesses and professionals that create, deliver and manage the airline passenger experience around the world. My name is Jonathan Norris. I'm the executive director of the Apex magazine and media platform, and it's my great pleasure to be back at CAS again to moderate this discussion panel. So just to give you a, a quick background about me before I introduce my panelists, um, I've worked in the aviation industry for 27 years. I know I don't look it. Um, and prior to my current role, I was head of the cabin design office at Airbus. I'm a chartered engineer, member of the Apex Technology Committee, and a regular speaker at industry conferences on a wide range of cabin, passenger, and crew issues. I'm delighted to be joined today by a very experienced panel of industry professionals who I'm going to introduce to you now. Um, unfortunately, Kate Haney from the Flyers' Rights um, group couldn't be with us today, so um, we're down to four on the panel, but I know it's going to be a very, very interesting session. So, um, from your right to, to left, we have Paul Bjordal, who's president and CEO of Aeromobile. Um, Paul has led Aeromobile since September 2010. He was previously based at the headquarters of Telenor, one of the world's largest providers of mobile communications, and a major shareholder in Aeromobile. Paul joined Telenor in 1999, initially as chief operating officer at Telenor Nokring, before becoming CEO of Telenor MCP, so Maritime Communications Partner in 2007. Next to Paul, Patrick Branley, Vice President, Corporate Communications, Product Publishing, Digital and Events with Emirates Airlines. Patrick has been with Emirates since 1992. He's primarily responsible for Emirates' industry-leading in-flight entertainment product, but he's also in charge of all their communications. The systems employed in the aircraft have grown substantially in terms of product offering and technology employed. Today, the Emirates ICE system offers more than 1,000 channels of entertainment as well as personal passenger connectivity. Patrick began his career in news media, then in marketing communications before joining Emirates. He has served on both the World Airline Entertainment Association, the WAEA, and the Apex boards in various positions, including president. Um, next to Patrick is Paul Misner, from, uh, who is Vice President, Global Public Policy at Amazon. Um, both an engineer and a lawyer, and as an engineer that fascinates me, that combination. Um, Paul is responsible for formulating and representing the company's public policy positions worldwide, as well as for managing policy specialists in Asia, Europe, and the Americas. Formerly a partner in a law firm, Paul also served as senior legal advisor to a commissioner of the US Federal Communications Commission. Prior to this government service, he was Intel Corporation's manager of telecommunications and computer technology policy, and leader of the computer industry's Internet Access Coalition. And um, last but not, certainly not least, Captain Derek Spicer, who's a, a senior training captain. Uh, Derek is a highly qualified airline training captain who flies both Airbus and Boeing aircraft types. He's rated and current on the Boeing 787 Dreamliner, the Boeing 737, the Airbus A320 and A330 aircraft. Throughout his career, he has trained over 800 pilots. In addition to this, Derek is an instructor on Warbird, classic aircraft, and helicopters. Starting his career serving in the Royal Navy, flying helicopters, and the Sea Harrier, he's now a consultant to Airbus, Boeing, British Airways, and EasyJet. So I'd just like to give a, um, a, a quick introduction before I get the ball rolling with a few questions. And um, what I'd ask is we, we'd like this session to be as interactive as possible. So if there are any questions from the floor, um, please raise your hand, we'll get you a mic, and um, before you um, ask the question, if you could just let us know your, your name and um, company, that would be great. So, an introduction, you know, what's the, what's the link between the aviation industry and the consumer electronics industry? So, as you'll all know, consumers have a rapidly um, expanding array of wireless devices, um, which with which they basically remain connected 24 hours a day to their work, to their family, to their friends. And the simple fact now, which is difficult to ignore, is that wireless technology has become ingrained in people's lives. You know, consumers are using devices to read books, watch television, movies, play games, and accomplish their day-to-day -day work, school, and family-related tasks. And now, let's relate that to the aviation industry. 
So in 2012, last year, the FAA, the US Federal Aviation Administration, um, put a, comment, a paper out for comments, basically asking aircraft operators, both you know, light aircraft right through to major airlines, and also other people involved in the aviation industry, whether it was um, time to kind of review and overhaul the, uh, the rules determining the use of personal electronic devices, PEDs, um, on aircraft during any phase of flight. So just to bring everyone up to a kind of speed about what you can and can't do in, in the US and, uh, and elsewhere. So current in the US, current FAA regulations generally prohibit the use of all PEDs during flight um, until you get to an altitude of 10,000 feet with the exception of portable voice recorders, hearing aids, things like pacemakers, electric shavers. Um, these regulations also provide an exemption for any other PED that the aircraft operator determined, sorry, um, you can use other PEDs once the operator, the onus is on the operator of the airline to determine that they don't cause interference with the aircraft. The intention of this discussion paper is to, is to look for feedback from the industry, from the traveling public, from various passenger, um, passenger rights groups, etc., as to whether these regulations should be overhauled. So once the comments have been collected, they've now finished the consultation stage, there will be uh, an aviation rulemaking committee put together. Um, both APEX and CEA and a number of the other um, associations and, and, and major companies in the industry which are we're here at CES are taking part in that rulemaking committee. So just to kind of finish off my intro, um, as part of that activity, APEX is working with the CEA on some consumer research with regards to the use of PEDs on aircraft in the US. And the data received to date is very preliminary, but what can clearly be seen already is that nearly all US airline passengers have brought at least one PED with them onto an airplane while traveling in the past 12 months, either in their checked-in baggage or as a carry-on item. And of those passengers, the majority feel it is important to be able to use PEDs when flying for either personal or business travel. So enough of me and my intro, and we'll, we'll start with some questions. And as I said, if, if there are questions from the floor, please raise your hand and let's bring you a microphone. So um, I'd like to, to start with a, a question for Patrick. Um, are current policies inhibiting innovation as well as passenger convenience? Um, I wouldn't say uh, uh, there is some inconvenience. Uh, passengers don't understand um, when they're using their phone on our planes why they have to switch them off over certain countries. So today as they enter American airspace, the uh, service uh, ceases. Uh, we have phones now on nearly 100 aircraft, um, have launched the product back in 2008, um, and uh, usage is, is, is accepted as quite a normal part of flying now. So it, it, it just becomes inconvenient. There's a few countries around the world that uh, inhibit the use over their airspace, um, and uh, passengers don't understand it. Okay. Um, Paul, is it? Sure, thanks, John. Um, at Amazon, we always start with our customers and work backwards, and so we recently polled them, essentially, we started to listen to what they are saying about the, uh, the current FAA rules and, and policies. And um, first of all, they're frustrated. Um, we get lots of comments saying things like stupid and dumb and idiotic and okay. So we're frustrated, but they're also very experienced flyers. Um, and they've been observing uh, that other passengers, they never sort of say themselves, but other passengers are keeping their PEDs on at all phases of flight. Uh, and this happens frequently, and I think we probably have all experienced this. We've at least seen somebody else do it. Uh, and uh, they're rightfully wondering uh, why planes aren't coming down if, uh, if this truly is a problem. Um, they also are aware that pilots are using PEDs in the cockpit and are questioning why they can use them and then passengers cannot. Um, they recognize, uh, and these are again from our customer comments, they also recognize that uh, there are dangers uh, of PEDs as projectiles and heavy turbulence, but they also recognize that physical books and binders and other such things uh, could also be equally dangerous. Um, and I think very importantly, they're asking this question, which is if these devices truly are a danger, if they po pose a danger to the, the flying public, why are they being allowed on board in the first place? And so uh, I'm also going to be participating in this aviation rulemaking committee. And I think our shared challenge as part of this process, along with the FAA, who is, which is to be congratulated for initiating this process, but our shared challenge is either making meaningful changes to the policy that exists today or 
explaining why meaningful change cannot be made. So you mentioned an interesting point about the number of devices which are left on. If I could ask the other Paul, do you have any kind of indication of how, how, how what, what kind of level of occurrence is that the devices are left on during flight? Yeah, we have uh, pretty good um, data on that because um, we install quite a few aircrafts where the service is not activated and um, uh, promoted until a bit later. So we can then read from our systems how many PEDs are trying to connect our systems. And on average, we see that um, there's between 20 and 30 devices that are left on, on board an aircraft without passengers actually knowing that they can connect to the system. The problem then with that would be that the, these 20 to 30 devices, if they can't connect to a network, is that they will try to uh, emit more and more power to find a network which is viable to, to them. Um, and in the end, they will try to emit as much power as they can possibly do. If you have a mobile network on board, which we install, they will immediately attach to our network and they will not be searching for other, other networks. So all the devices that are on board will be emitting minimum power to, uh, to, uh, to, um, uh, to uh, try to communicate. So by installing a, a mobile system, even though it sounds a little bit strange, you are actually putting in an additional safety precaution because you're uh, preventing all the uh, PEDs to, to emit on, on high power. Okay. And, and do you see any difference between the use um, from, let's say, outside of the US between voice and data via, you know, mobile telephony? Well, if you look at um, GSM, you, you have three basic services. You have voice, you have SMS, and you have mobile data. Um, Voice is, uh, is quite stable. Uh, the usage there is, uh, is not changing much. Uh, SMS is uh, growing quite steadily. But the one service that is really showing us a, a really good growth is uh, mobile data. People are using their smartphones to, uh, to uh, read emails. They are posting their status on Facebook. They are tweeting. And, um, I mean, what better way to, to spend a few hours on, on board an aircraft than to uh, keep, keep in touch with your family and friends. So I think it was Patrick who also talked about um, you know, use of devices in the, in the cockpit. So a uh, question for, for Derek. Um, what are your experience in terms of the, the aircraft types you've flown on and potential interference from you know, devices? Yeah, uh, thanks, John. Hi, everybody. Um, it's very, it's very interesting, actually, as you are working with a number of operators or a number of manufacturers, actually in a number of countries around the world, that actually the views are very, very different. Um, some uh, civil aviation authorities can move quite quickly. They may be smaller. They may be have less red tape uh, to cut through. So we do see a big variation, even amongst the operators as well. Um, personally, Personally, I haven't experienced um, uh, electric magnetic interference with aircraft systems. But there is anecdotal evidence, and of course there have been tests that have been done. And one of the difficulties that we have from a manufacturer's point of view is that the tests are under test conditions and they're very controlled. Um, as we produce aircraft, which are going to have a service life of maybe 25, 30 years, it's very difficult to predict what sort of devices we're going to be using in years to come. So the main point from us is that certification is a very slow, uh, laboured process. Um, just picking up on a point that Paul made is that uh, as operators of airliners, as manufacturers of airliners, actually uh, we're not driven by the customer, we're driven by the safety standard, which of course benefits the customer. Um, so this is probably, um, in my memory, one of the first um, problems that has been driven by customer need on, a, on a, almost a commercial basis. So there's a, there is a reluctance of operators and manufacturers to move quickly. Um, having said that, um, there has been anecdotal evidence of um, certain systems that, that do have problems. And it's, it's a generalization, but actually the older aircraft, the early analog aircraft, tend to be pretty good. Um, everything that's coming out recently, the Boeing 787, the latest Airbuses, seem to be um, very um, well protected. 
And there have been some incidents of what I would call mid-school aircraft, um, and it's been quite well documented. The, um, the Honeywell Phase 3 displays did have uh, some issues. But the airlines are working through that. Um, I believe that Southwest should have um, a clearance for, for Wi-Fi by the end of this year. So it's not as quick as we would like as travelling public, um, but there is movement there. Um, I do identify with uh, the passenger frustration of seeing a cabin attendant walking through with a tablet, quite obviously, as they're telling a passenger to switch off their, uh, their cell phone. Um, and I can see that that uh, can be a bit of an issue. But we do have to remember that when we operate aircraft and we have standard operating procedures, which are very carefully thought out, it goes back into being a very controlled environment. So if there are PDs in use by pilots, uh, we call them EFB, electronic flight bag, um, we can control that. We can switch it off at times when we think there's a sensitivity, take off and landing. Um, and as more information comes from research, we can adapt our procedures. So the questions within operators are really quite simple. What makes it more difficult for us is getting the guidance from these panels, especially um, with the FAA, as to how the um, government would like it to be proceeded forward and also how the, the public would. Um, we do want to be able to see passengers being able to relax, use these services. There's good news for the airlines because there are commercial services. There's a commercial benefit, especially in the content and the streaming of content. And we are there for the benefit and the safety of passengers, but also for their well-being and for them to enjoy their flight. Okay. Um, thank you. Sorry, question in the front. Um, hi, sir. Yes, it depends on the operator. I've, I've experienced in, in two areas of this. Um, one is um, a very successful airline in India, Indigo, low-cost carrier. They operate A320s. Um, they have the issues with uh, weather. They have some real weather over there, just like the Midwest here. Um, so it's important for them to have uh, streaming for data for weather, for weather avoidance, and that's just generally available data off the internet. It's not a specific aviation application, which I think is quite a, an indicator for us of what could go forward. Um, there's another operator in Europe, EasyJet, that I've flown with, and they switch off the devices for takeoff and landing. Not a bad thing, because you don't really want the pilots using those devices during the takeoff and landing. You want them to fly the aeroplane. So it doesn't have a, a negative effect on the operation. So it's quite easy for us to introduce those rules. Um, and again, we, we, we are rule-based. We work on this system. Uh, for passengers, it's frustrating when their um, experience is rule-based. And what we want to be able to do is open it up. So yes, it varies between operator. But there are, there are operators that, uh, without good information, choose to take the easier path of, of shutting them down for takeoff and landing. So the gentleman in the red shirt had his um, hand up. If you could just um, let us know your name and company. All right, thank you, Rory Brisky, Brisky Consulting. It should also be noted that for the equipment used, tablets used as EFBs, electronic flight bags up on the flight deck, they're also not just any tablet off the street. There's still comprehensive testing that has to be done by model number and specific unit. So it's not just any unit that somebody can grab and use in the cockpit. Okay, thank you. Yeah, that's a good point. So the, yeah, gentlemen, thank you. Uh, Daniel Sokolov from the Heise Media Group from Germany. Um, Mr. Bjorl put forward that from his data, there on average 20 to 30 phones that are left on or, or wireless devices. So my question is, is it a regulatory issue? Is it something that could be solved with regulation because the U.S. can have another 100 years the rules. Once Mr. Branley flies his aircraft, then everybody has to switch it off. It's not happening. Um, we, we don't have the data that a f uh, plane's falling off the, fly, off, off, off the sky because of it. So, so are we just going to have announcements going on in the plane, turn it off, 30% of the passengers are ignoring it or, or forgetting about it, or they hear conflicting information. They say, turn it off, but re remain seated. And that's the moment when you realize, oh, it's, it's up in the overhead compartment, and you have to ask the two people next to you to get up. But they just said, remain seated. So what do you do, right? Um, what, 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 what is the way out of this? Paul, do you want to comment? 
Well, uh, first of all, uh, since you're from Germany, I, I think it's interesting to note that uh, we see demographic differences between how many handsets are left on, um, which probably ex has something to do with cultural differences. Uh, Lufthansa is actually the fleet where we see the fewest handsets left on. Uh, uh, <laughs> Germans are, are quite strict uh, in, in following rules. Um, Okay. <laughs> um, but uh, but uh, uh, basically, these 20 to 30 handsets do not uh, pose um, uh, a risk. Uh, we, we, we have never seen an aircraft being uh, affected by this. Uh, uh, but by adding a, a GSM system on board, at least what you do is that you make sure that these handsets are transmitting on low power. Uh, so. so we are uh, actually uh, affecting the way the, the handsets are working uh, by, by installing systems. Patrick, do you have anything to add from an airline perspective? I think it, it's, a, it's an absolute reality that people are going to have devices uh, switched on in the future and it's going to happen more and more. Um, you know, this is a camera, comes with a SIM card, Wi-Fi network. That, that, that the kind of connected devices, it isn't just phones. It's, you know, you may walk on the aircraft with four or five devices that are somehow attached. And uh, it's, it's up to the industry quickly to ensure that uh, uh, regulation and uh, uh, that is common sense is put in place, not just from a customer service point of view, but it's, it's to ensure that pa passengers are confident that this is being addressed. And I think it has been ignored for, for too long. It's been this kind of um, elephant in the room and the public of, you know, common sense prevails. Question over here, Mr. Monty. I have a question about the Pico cells that are being Sorry, put Sorry, can you just give your name and company? Oh, Cy Monty from Various. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know who I am this week. Um, the original Pico cells were designed to uh, interfere with uh, local GSM coverage to try and stop them negotiating with other cell phone towers? Is that still part of the practice? Is that, how does that affect the, the safety areas of limiting GSM frequency, or GSM power on the cell phone? Uh, if you know. when, when you talk about Pico cells, uh, uh, we, we don't actually have Pico cells in, in the aircraft but, uh, currently, but we, we do have um, uh, systems to, f first of all, we only have our systems active uh, above a certain altitude, it's 5,000 meters, uh, where it's proven that there will be no interference between the systems on board and the systems on the, on the ground. Uh, uh, we also have um, uh, a technology to further ensure that you don't get that interference, uh, which uh, you refer to as jammers. Uh, but it's, it's basically to make sure that the phone does not try to, uh, on high power, uh, interact with, uh, with the systems on, 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 on the ground. But when we are operating above 5,000 meters, uh, there is no uh, interference between the, the, the systems. Mary. Uh, yes, Mary Kirby, editor of Airline Passenger Experience Magazine. Pal, um, am I right in saying that your in-flight connectivity system is not permitted to be used in the cockpit? And why is that? That is purely a certification uh, issue. Um, uh, the way the systems have been certified, they are certified for use outside of the cockpit. Uh, and, and that's not something we have challenged. Uh, the, that could be because they don't want air pilots to be engaged in phone calls with friends and family when they're taking off and landing or, or some other reason, but uh, that's a certification issue. Patrick, since uh, you have an uh, aeromobile system on your aircraft on Emirates, do you have any interest then in having uh, connectivity in the cockpit for real-time electronic flight bag applications at all? Um, we have a lot of systems in the cockpit that will communicate with the ground um, onto displays that are in the cockpit, but going forward, it, you know, the, there is the spectre that, that and I think uh, David referred to it, that there's more information available on the internet than the, co than the pilot may have in, on his screens in the, dis you know, in, the, in, the, uh, in the cockpit, which is kind of crazy. So it would be 
better to have all, as much information as possible. So you'd envisage eventually uh, being able to offer that type of real-time mapping, et cetera, a broader pan band uh, pipe to the cockpit? I think eventually uh, the cockpit displays will be bringing that kind of information um, to the pilots, whether that's on an embedded display or a loose display um, is another thing. I, I think in the short term it will probably be a loose display, in the long term it will be an embedded display because of the convenience. You know. I, just to pick up on that, the, um, we spend a lot of our training uh, careers with line pilots trying to reduce their cognitive load mm -hmm. because there's a mass of information and the more modern the aircraft gets, um, they become a, a toy box for designers to be able to immerse the pilot with information. Um, and cockpit crews are not, um, they're not multitaskers. They're actually prioritizers, very, very good at prioritizing information into a single line. Um, so there are very few occasions where actually we're crying out for more information. Possibly the one exception actually is, is weather because weather is so unpredictable and you do need a kind of a real-time aspect to it. Anybody who's flown light airplanes or flown around the Midwest or anybody who's uh, certainly flown in India um, would say that that's the case. You do need a bit of a real-time aspect to it. Um, most of the information that's, that's passing to and from the aircraft at the moment up to this point is actually uh, downlinking information back. Um, it's very fascinating in a way that over the last few years, if we have a minor fault or a minor failure on board the aircraft, you can actually arrive at your destination with the part required almost on its way or maybe actually uh, with the engineer ready to be fitted. So there are great advantages to the operation of the aircraft, but there isn't so much of a, a hunger amongst the uh, operating companies to try and get more information on board. But that one occasion when something's going wrong, it's nice to have as a backup. But uh, I don't know if that answers your question, Mary. Another question at the front, if we have the microphone. Hi, I'm Howard Buskirk with Communications Daily. Uh, my question, and I, and I don't know th that much about this particular area, because my beat's pretty broad, but I have written about it a little bit, and I, I just wanted to, it seemed like there was some comment that there's some classes of airplanes where there may be some pr problems presented still to the electronic systems, while there are other classes where the s systems are, do not have problems. And I'm just wondering, is that a point in which there's general consensus um, among you all and in the industry, or is that something that's a matter that, that's you know, that's been debated or not. I just don't, you know, yeah. it's... Thanks, yeah, Howard. Yeah, that's a, a very good question. The simple answer is no. There isn't a consensus within the industry. Um, a lot of the evidence is anecdotal. And actually, how do you test? Uh, I mean, I'm not a flight test engineer, but how do you test for electromagnetic magnetic interference in a, in a quantifiable way? What's the difference between an A380 operated by Emirates and a 737 operated by Southwest? It's too far... Uh, a range to be able to give a, a quantifiable answer. And I, in my opinion, I believe that's why we've had a delay in being able to get a, a, a clear view from the Federal Aviation Authority. Paul, you want to add something? Yeah, uh, the fact is that uh, the systems that we install uh, are certified uh, for each specific uh, tail type. So for a Boeing 737, there's a specific certification for an Airbus 3. 20, there's a specific certification. So all of the airframes are dealt with specifically in the certification process. So you don't automatically get certified for all types of aircraft if you certify your systems. And if there's a new aircraft coming, you have to recertify your system for that type of aircraft. So that's being dealt with uh, on a practical level. Sorry, Paul Emmy, I think it, you had a comment. It, to make. And that's the reason why you don't see a lot of PEDs being allowed on airplanes because the rules have devolved to the point where it really is each airline is required to test each device with each plane and therefore no testing gets done, no certification gets done and the gigantic experiment which is people leaving their devices on anyway goes on. I think the number quoted by one of our customers uh, said that something like five, I 
getting this right, gazillion uh, experiments have happened over the past uh, couple decades and no problems. Uh, so it's, it's hard to reconcile both of these things. Clearly planes are different, devices are different, uses, uh, locations, uh, duty cycles of devices. I mean, you can, you can imagine a panoply of things, but then if, if you were approaching this with a clean slate, without any experience, it could be daunting and scary. But at the same time, we're exp you know, experiencing these five gazillion tests. Just as a, an add to that, just for those that may be not in, uh, in aware of aviation areas, um, supplementary certification. So an aircraft is certified originally very, very specifically. And then when an operator wants to change uh, a design or wants to make an addition or an add or a mod, um, then they will go through this certification process. Um, a colleague of mine recently was involved with the modification of a privately owned Airbus, an Airbus corporate jet, and the owner decided that they wanted to have a shower room next to their bedroom. Who wouldn't want to on the privately owned Airbus? How, fa how fantastic is that? Um, and the water system design for this shower, just to get this shower room fitted, was over $10 million. Now that's a very expensive shower. Uh, which, uh, but it gives you a bit of an idea about the time and the scale of making even the smallest change and modification uh, to the actual certification of the aeroplane, and thus it's a slow process. I just wanted to come back over some of the confusion from a passenger point of view. Um, I'll ask this to Patrick first. Why is it that airlines all seem to have different rules on when you can switch your mobile phone off? So um, I know, for example, I'm more familiar living in Europe, you know, British Airways, and uh, you know, typically you can't use your mobile phone until you've reached the gate and the door is open. In the US, typically, as soon as the wheels are on the ground, you hear an announcement that you can use your phone. Um, what's, the, what's the rule at Emirates, and why is it different to anyone else's? Um, uh, phones are allowed during flight. Uh, they're to be switched off on descent at about uh, 10 or 20,000 feet, depending on, we have two types of systems on the plane here different altitudes which they are switched off. And then as the plane leaves the active runway, we say you can now switch your phone on. Um, and that's pretty standard. But I think in the absence of uh, good direction to the industry, each airline has inde independently just generated their own rules. Okay. And passengers don't understand it, why you've got different rules on different airlines. Yeah. So do you see a benefit in coming up with a consistent set of rules for the industry as a whole to, to apply? We're a service business. We have to keep customers happy. If customers, uh, when they land, want to want to connect with their loved ones or business colleagues, and uh, you know, in those 10 or 15 minutes while they're taxiing to the gate, um, it can be that long. Uh, it's it's useful for them to be able to connect. It probably stops them getting up and walking about the plane during that time, which is probably helpful. But you know, I, I stood at an airport once and watched people get off a, a short haul flight in Europe, and you know, it was about eight out of ten people were on the telephone. This was a few years back. Um, this, this kind of need to communicate and stay in touch um, is, is, is there, and as a, as a customer-oriented organization, we need to uh, enable that. Mm. But I think that the water has a great way of leveling, and when other airlines uh, hear the different rules when they fly on other airlines, uh, they tend to go back to their home base and change their rule. So it is... It is um, you think things are moving, then? Things are moving, yeah. Okay. Other question? Lady in red? Sorry, can you just... Oh, sorry, he's got the microphone. We'll come to you next, sorry. Hi, it's me again. Um, I've heard that WestJet, uh, with, their, with the new uh, library inside their planes, are going to move to a, a bring your own for in-flight entertainment. So they're, they're throwing out in-flight entertainment they have with the, with the old seats, putting in new seats, which so they can fit in more passengers. And there's a Wi-Fi, and passengers are invited to bring their tablet and, bu and then buy whatever in-flight entertainment the airline offers. Um, is that is that true? I mean, I've read, read it in the papers, and I'm a journalist. There's a lot in the papers which is not necessarily <laughs> um, um, going to happen as 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 we write it. So, um, is that true? And how are they doing it? They fly here in the U.S., they fly in Canada, and a couple of places around here. Thanks. WestJet. Anyone want to answer? Yeah, I'm, I can't comment for WestJet themselves, but it's been done elsewhere. Um, it's been done elsewhere. It was done quite successfully in Australia um, very early on. And I think um, certainly using passengers' own devices is certainly a way forward. Initially, and I believe it was Jetstar that did it originally, uh, they actually bought up a load of tablets and started handing them out. Yeah. They did find that it wasn't uh, a rugged enough um, 
uh, fixture to be able to, to make it work. And in fact, they also did another one, which I thought was quite clever, which was to have uh, a dock in the back of the seat. So you've got power for uh, a device. Now, that's a difficult thing when you've got a wealth of uh, tablets, and of course, they're all outside this room now. Um, but there are different ways of, uh, ways of doing it, and seat design is important. Um, we've, we've seen the weight of seats half. John is an expert on this uh, over the last few years. Um, it's getting better and better. So, yeah, there are innovative ways of doing it. We want to encourage that. And in actual fact, um, correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, seat fittings don't fall under... Um, certification, type certification, so provided they're tested correctly to the right standard, um, you can vary the interior fit and that's quite popular with airlines that buy older types and want to refresh the interior and make it more of an enjoyable passenger experience. So I'm not so sure about WestJet themselves, but it's a, that's a way that some operators want to take it. Yeah, I mean, if I can jump out, I mean, in the IFE world, there's a number of airlines which are doing trials or, or have flying systems which utilise consumer electronic tablets and then have media either preloaded on them or it's streamed to that, to that device. Um, it, there's a whole number of issues which it brings up in terms of you know, rights, whether they have early window content, which is you know, pre-DVD release content. Um, the certification is very, very different, but I mean, as Derek mentioned, you know, Jetstar, I think, brought up something like 6,000 iPads. They had them ruggedized. They have RFID so that if somebody, if they accidentally walk off the aircraft, there's an alarm that sounds. They have an extra 10-hour battery pack on the back. Um, they're then tested and vetted by all the studios, the Hollywood studios, the majors, to see whether they can have early window content. It's a very involved process, but there are airlines out there who are looking at using increasingly consumer electronics um, you know, really comes down to the, the experience that that airline wants to give their passenger, um, you know, what level of, you know, uh, the level of viewing experience, the, the amount of content, the different types of content. It, th there's a lot, you know, there's, there's, there's quite a big range of um, products which are now out there in the market. Because, okay, because, yeah, so currently in the, in the United States, the FCC banned the use of GSM CDMA in US airspace. So, um, you know, there are, other, there are some isolated other countries in the world that have the same regulation, um, but, you know, typically for the, uh, predominantly in this, for example, Europe and the Middle East, there is no regulation like that. So carriers coming from Europe and the Middle East who have these systems on board they can use that service until it gets to US airspace and then it has to be switched off. So, Paul, you want to add? And that's act actually the onboard installation that's being switched off. Uh, so, uh, when you reach uh, 100 nautical miles off the, the US uh, border, we switch off the systems. But just to be clear, that's the, that's the mobile phone system. It's not the, the, the IFE. I mean, typically, again, each individual airline will have a, have a you know an altitude at which they then switch the IFE system on so that the crew cabin crew can prepare for landing. The, the Wi-Fi can stay on. Sorry, the lady in red. You've been very patient. Thank you. I am Tecla Perry with IEEE Spectrum Magazine. Um, some years ago, researchers tried to measure some onboard EMI, like live during flight, of, you know, what PEDs were happening. And what they found at the time, my understanding is, is that it wasn't necessarily the device that was out of the box in great condition that you, people would have tested it in that way that was the problem. It was the ones that somehow had been dropped or someone had modified them or there was some, you know, some issues, something had changed with the device and they were creating much more EMI than they should have been. And so my question is, is that an issue still that, you know, that, that it's not, and, and if it is, how do, you, how do you screen for that? You know, just testing devices doesn't get to this problem. Very interestingly, at a conference in about 1996, a speaker uh, was talking to this exact point about how a CD player that a passenger had modified had caused interference on a plane um, and he was talking this whole tale. And then somebody from that airline, which I think was KLM, stood up and he said, well, I'm in charge of technical at that airline, and that's a myth. And it hadn't happened. And the, 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 there's been a lot of uh, myths that have happened over the years. A, a lot of these stories, you have, if you dig into them, 
you'll find a lot of them are, are quite nonsense. Now, of course, with any system, uh, there is always a chance that somebody will build a system from parts at Radio Shack. So you need the aircraft to be resilient to the, the whole radio spectrum in that, in that area. I, I am aware, actually, that in the 787 design, there was a slight, uh, and they had time to do it, there was a slight backtrack from using wireless systems on board. Um, and it wasn't a case of um, they knew there was a problem. It was a case of let's default to something that we know. So for a small amount of weight gain, some of the vital systems that started out as wireless systems were then becoming hardwired systems towards the end of the design. So my feeling is it's the aircraft design which will take us forward, so making the aircraft resilient to, to EMI and also um, the, uh, the rulemaking and certification issues. I think the point that you raise is very important when we talk about the experiments that, that we were trying to find out whether EMI would affect certain displays and systems, and we just couldn't because, as you said, there's either genuine or, or false information. It could be anecdotal information. But the, the variance in EMI is too great, whether it be a modified device or not, for us to be able to say definitively these items cause problems and these ones don't. So I, for one, would like to see us making the aircraft resilient and making our, our standard procedures uh, resilient and, and moving forward from that. It, John, if I may. Please. It's actually one of the things about that, uh, your question, I think it also goes to the five gajillion uh, tests. I mean, presumably many of the devices or some subset of those devices would be damaged in some way to change their RF emissions. Um, I, I think it's probably getting less problematic with all solid state devices, which are either are binary, right? It either works or it doesn't. Unlikely to get uh, out of sync somehow uh, by dropping. Um, one thing I think is important to clarify here in this discussion, we've, we've been talking simultaneously, I think, about uh, two, di two different classes of uh, device or device transmission. Um, one is intentional, so this is the mm -hmm. GSM, the uh, 3G, 4G, Wi-Fi, where you're actually trying to transmit, your device is trying to communicate with something, and so a lot of the products we've been talking about here are in that mode. But there's also unintentional radiation from devices when they're in the non-transmit mode. And this is obviously, I hope obviously, uh, a far lower level uh, signal strength coming out of devices unintentionally. So processors and video processors in particular, some screens, some displays, uh, actually emit radiation unintentionally. And, and that radiation level is very low. So there's actually an intermediate point where you can imagine below 10,000 feet devices being able to be used. Um, solo, uh, in isolation, just as unintentional radiators because the radiation levels are so much lower. And then at some, le at some uh, safer altitude, perhaps the intentional radiation could be turned on. But I think it's important to distinguish between the two. Yeah, no, I think that's a good point. Um, another question here, gentleman in the red shirt. Rory Brisky, Brisky Consulting. And just exactly to that point, there's a lot of testing done on a lot of devices, but those, especially non-intentional uh, emitters, are typically done in isolation. So you'll test one unit and they'll say, okay, well, we have a low level. But as you add more and more and more of these units, that energy is additive no, on not. the aircraft. No, it turns out it's not. We've actually done some testing and it doesn't add like that uh, for a lot of, lot of reasons. But it, you know, three devices is not more power than one. It's not three times more power than one. It's actually significantly less than three. It, it is less than three, but it is still an additive component. And it, in the testing that I've done in the EMI labs, that's a, that's a true Yeah, story. well, so there are all sorts of issues, of course. Passengers are separated by distance, right? So you don't have 50 passengers in one area. They're separated throughout the plane. And this radiation rolls off very quickly with distance, right? So. Um, you're right that there, you know, more than one device is going to have more power than one device. I mean, it's given, but it's not, it's not uh, linear. Yeah, no, absolutely, absolutely correct. It's not linear. But one of the things you have to keep in mind as well is that on an aircraft, you have all these antennas, the antenna farm on an aircraft, which are open to windows, and you have a lot of EMI emissions from inside the cabin going right out the windows and right into the antennas. 
and that's something that is not shielded because it's designed to be picking up that RF energy. So within the aircraft, the cables are very well shielded, very well protected, but as you get energy from within the aircraft transmitting outside through the windows, you can pick up that in the antennas, and I've seen that be a problem in the past. NASA, I think, still maintains its anonymous database for pilots to um, comment on, and there's tens of thousands of anecdotal uh, evidence in there, and if you start reading through some of those, and you'll see, okay, well, the pilot had an issue with the flight deck instruments, and they made an announcement, hey, everybody, we have a problem, please turn off your, your stuff, and the problem goes away, that's a pretty strong indication that there was some handheld or portable device that was causing the issue. Yeah. So those anecdotes are, are, you know, have to be taken into account. And I think the FAA very wisely is thinking about everything in the totality. I mean, safety is the goal here, right? It's just, you know, how far do you take it? Right now, devices certified for uh, in-cockpit use are measured against what is called an emission mask, which is basically uh, a power level uh, permissible per frequency. And so there are certain frequencies that are just more sensitive than others. And you, you mentioned the exterior antennas on an aircraft. Well, certainly that's an open front end. They're trying to receive. They're trying to receive faint signals. And so they're, you know, all ears. Those kinds of things need uh, what they typically call an emission mask, a notch, which is just a lower level of power uh, is, per, is, uh, is required than in other frequencies that are not as sensitive. And so it seems to me that one possible way to uh, address this holistically would be for an agency such as the FCC, which does this kind of testing already through uh, accredited laboratories, to be able to test devices against an emission mask. And that emission mask would take into account exactly what you say, which are the sensitivity, particularly sensitive frequencies for an aircraft. So, Paul, do you want to add? I, it's just that when we've done the certification and testing so far, it's not like we've used uh, 10, 15, 20, 50 devices. I think uh, when we did the original testing, we tested with 1,500 devices centered on the most critical equipment. So, so we have a, a pretty significant uh, margin of safety there to, to work with as well. Uh, yeah. So it was all central, centered towards the critical equipment. Oh, sorry, gentleman at the back. Thank you. <clears throat> Jean-Claude Brien, District Canada. Basically, I'm the uh, Spectrum Regulator for Canada, representing uh, the equivalent of the FCC. Uh, I wanted to raise a point that you raised, Mr. Messner, about the fact that uh, you have two agencies to deal with in this issue, the FAA and the FCC, in the case of Canada, it's Transport Canada and Industry Canada. Uh, and yes, indeed, all the devices, like license exempt devices, are gonna get onto, uh, onto your planes, have already masked to, uh, to, to, be, uh, to meet in order to be on the market. Uh, so you have a way now to identify themselves. Uh, there's an interesting point also as a point of regulator that we need to have more, uh, is about more information about the reality of some myth or are, are they myth or not. For example, the problem of electronic uh, uh, EMC in airplanes. Uh, my colleagues from Transport Canada has anecdote about it and they still keep the rules. I mean, there's some ways for us as regulator to receive more data so that we can move forward with a realistic uh, uh, approach. A point that now that RF is going to be in the airplane is uh, also uh, provided by the fact that the next world radio conferences we're looking at frequencies for what they call wakes, wireless intra-aircraft communication, to reduce the weight of the wires. And they're looking at bands in like the five gigahertz and uh, four gigahertz area. So you're going to see more and more RF into the, the new airplanes. Consequently, they're going to be more EMC capable of giving you toes. The point also interesting about the, wi uh, the Wi-Fi on WestJet, interesting, I will probably give them a call, <laughs> is that uh, from a um, point of view of the consumer, we buy our devices, we bring it everywhere. An airplane that's going to put a Wi-Fi router, suddenly on a regulatory point of view, it's not a license exempt. It's a kind of a air, uh, what they call aeronautical mobile. So we have to deal with that. We're working on this one. But the point is maybe for Mr. Brandley, how does then uh, this base station or this transmitter is regulatorily uh, considered in an airplane? Is it licensed as any others or is there any different way of dealing with it? Um, whatever equipment is put on the aircraft has to 
uh, pass extremely uh, stringent testing. Uh, safety is, is not ever compromised. Um, I think the, the discussion here is, is largely about uh, the passenger use of wireless networks. There are plenty of other wireless networks already on the aircraft um, that have been used uh, for many years. Our first uh, mobile phone, our first telephone solution um, that we installed in about 1993 or 94 was in fact a wireless portable telephone that was wall mounted. Um, we then went to wired in-seat phones for convenience and uh, now we're back at wireless mobile phones. You can use your own uh, device. Um, and the, the, the networks that are on the aircraft, I mean, these are not cheap systems to install. You know, often hundreds of thousands of dollars because of all the tests that's paying for the testing as well as the hardware creation. Um, it's not, you know, we just go down to Best Buy and get a router. I mean, airlines really can't do that. I don't know if that's where you buy routers. <laughs> you buy them at Amazon. Amazon. You buy them at Amazon. <laughs> um, <laughs> and also, inst instead of having one or two antenna points in the cabin, what we do is that we install a leaky feeder cable throughout the cabin, so you have a minimum uh, emission power going out through the cabin. So it's, it's a completely different setup than, uh, than what you see in, in a traditional GSM network where the phone has to communicate with the base station over long distance. So in fact, uh, you confirmed what I thought is that uh, we have to look at it at both ways, the FAA slash FCC, because from what I've heard, one of the major restrictions now from the airplanes coming over the United States, and I probably think Canada also, is that there is the uh, impact on the licensed service providers, which has nothing to do with an FAA regulation. But we have to also have information in order to work with them and work on the regulatory point of view to allow that. So there's two sides of the problem that we have to work with the industry. And again, information is always the best to, tool to allow us to move forward. Okay, thanks. Um, question here and then. Uh, Simon D. again. Um, I wanted to. I wanted to ask a question because we, there's a disparity between the two areas. Electro, um, I want my electronics as quickly as I can. Uh, it's reactive versus proactive. When uh, my Kindle suddenly starts killing people in my house, Amazon deals with that when it happens. The, you, obviously, you create products and then you deal with them afterwards in the, electri in the consumer electronics in in-flight systems. You want to make sure that nothing will ever happen uh, you know, there, I mean, there are percentages of what chance the wings will fall off, but you, you design systems for success, not for marketability or for, pretty, for the consumer. That's, uh, that's why I see the disparity between I want to get the devices out there really quickly and we don't want them to ever interfere with flight systems. Is that that's something that consumers are just going to have to kind of count on? That we have this discussion between the, between the two groups all the time? How, how much do you see the disparity between reactive versus proactive? That's my question. Paul? And I'll, Sorry, I'll give it Paul to, B. to Amazon and to, <laughs> to one, one of the other guys. It took us um, three years from we developed the technology before we actually installed it on an aircraft. Uh, we've been working in this, with this technology now for uh, eight and a half years. Uh, we've been operating it in, on Amherst for five years. We are now operating it on 12 airlines, I believe, uh, on around 150 aircrafts. So, so this is not something where you make little and hope that it works. It, it's, you're actually touching on the major cost base in my operation, and that is to work with the certification agencies, to work on the technology to make sure that this is safe when we install it. And that's also why the owners of this business are uh, main players in, the, in the, this industry. It's Telenor as Teleco and it's Panasonic Aviation as a uh, uh, technology partner. So, so it's not, it's not a, a backyard business. I'm sorry, um, Paul M. <laughs> I'm not sure Amazon is either. Um, Look, so I don't, I don't buy the notion that we plan for failure. We plan for success. We have to put out, you look around the floor here, this is an incredibly competitive industry, uh, and the devices have to work, and they have to work from the start. Uh, plus, the device does have to go uh, undergo 
testing by the FCC to ensure that it meets uh, uh, certain emission criteria to prevent interference to other devices and such. So it goes through a certification process already. It just seems to me one way to approach the uh, in-flight use question issue would be to add an additional certification that would allow the device to be compliant with uh, the, uh, the, the safety needs of the, uh, of the aircraft. Sorry, there was a question, this gentleman here in the blue shirt. Oh, sorry. Did you ask first, Mary? Sorry, I'll come back to you. I'm Ken Beeler from Virgin America. Um, one interesting thing is in the history of our little airline, we've had Wi-Fi from the very beginning on our airplanes all the time. And we've never had a lick of trouble. Now, that's not to say that it doesn't happen, because I think the older airplanes are more susceptible. But certainly aircraft, in my humble opinion, that have been qualified for HERF protection are a lot more capable of dealing with this kind of situation. I, I guess the point I'd like to get across, much to what Patrick said uh, much earlier, is we really need, as a society, to demand that OEMs produce an aircraft that is tolerant of PEDs and TPEDs. There is a process through RTCA document DO307 that enables an OEM to qualify an aircraft for TPED tolerance. And I think we as a society need to demand that OEMs uh, always produce aircraft that meet that standard. Mary, sorry. No worries. Um, beyond electromagnetic interference, however, there are other reasons that are being argued why one should keep their devices uh, put away. Obviously, flight attendants have safety briefings that they want people to pay attention to, even though nobody seems to pay attention, but they still want have to go through the dog and pony show. And also the, the concern about um, if there was an aborted takeoff, uh, if everybody has their iPads and their Kindles out, uh, would you have projectiles in the aircraft? Can anybody tell me how long you think the FAA is going to take to study this issue? Do you really think that they're just kind of giving lip service to it to shut you all up and um, ultimately are, are going to err on the side of caution and say, listen, you know, beyond even EMI and all the points and all the five gazillion aircraft, that there's still other reasons why it might make sense to just, um, you know, make passengers keep them away? Let me take the first shot at this. I I'm right in there with what the FAA is doing, and so I can see, I've seen it up close and personal. Um, and this is not lip service. They are very serious. The, uh, the agency leadership is, uh, is determined to make a, uh, a very uh, reasoned, well thought out decision uh, of whether to maintain the current uh, rules or, or modify them somehow. Uh, I, I see no you know, foot dragging on, part of the, on the part of the FAA at all. Uh, there are considerations beyond RF interference, for sure, the, the projectile, the, uh, the distractions. And you can, you can imagine there are different levels of distraction. For example, earphones uh, could be far more distracting than uh, reading a, an e-book, uh, just like you can read a, a newspaper today. Uh, so those things need to be taken into account. I really feel like if we come up with a sensible solution uh, that the, the cabin crews will benefit from this mightily because they won't be in a position of conflict with passengers. They won't have to be explaining things that they, they, they're hard to justify for the reasons I've described before. And so um, the FAA has gone about to uh, uh, charter this advisory committee, um, this aviation rulemaking committee it's called, uh, with representatives of all of these stakeholders. So it's not just aircraft manufacturers or airlines, it's those plus uh, representatives of the cabin crew, plus representatives of the in-plane uh, equipment manufacturers, plus PED manufacturers, and so on. Uh, so I, I really have high hopes uh, for what the FAA is doing. Sorry, we're, we're going to wrap it up in um, just one final comment from Derek about the safety briefing. Yeah, I mean, it's it's more than just an intention or a, a done deal. The, the safety requirement for passengers, for passenger briefing, um, is actually set in treaty. It's an international convention. So operators are required by law to have open and rigid systems for briefing passengers. Now, you can't stop somebody um, from looking out of a window, and you can't force somebody to pay attention. 
but at the end of the day, the operators are there to uh, infuse the information as best they possibly can. And it's all about best efforts uh, for duty of care for passengers, and that's exactly where this comes in. Where we draw the line, whether we say that someone's got to take their earbuds out or switch a device off for that two minutes, um, that's something that will come out of these, of these inquiries. Um, but the safety side is, is uh, you could almost say, a done deal. That's the very start where everything comes from. Every single word of all of those public address PAs that come across has been uh, actually written down, thought out, and learned. So we are uh, rule-based for the safety and the benefit of the passengers. So it's how we integrate these rules in with this existing system. Um, it does feel a little bit draconian as a passenger when you've got uh, cabin attendants being so forceful in making sure that you switch them off. Um, but that's with good reason. That's because th those are the rules that we're working with at the moment. And I think we've established, even in this conversation today, that we actually don't have all of the background information to be able to change these rules yet. And much as there's huge amount of anecdotal evidence, um, I think I would scare myself if I started to look on the internet at some of these uh, um, sites that post a lot of these problems that people put in. So uh, all I would say is, you know, it is there for your safety and we, uh, we try our best efforts. Thank you. So I'd like to um, thank all my panelists this afternoon. Thank you for your time. It's been thank a great you. conversation. <laughs> and I'd um, like to thank all of the audience for coming along to listen to us. So enjoy the rest of your CES and um, have a good evening. Thank you. Bye-bye. Likewise.